In recent years, people have been saying there's a lack of innovation in video games. To which I reply, SCREW THAT NOISE! When you get right down to it, all you need to make a great game is just a bit of programming software, a good amount of hard work, and a development budget that could happen in a nuclear battleship. Sometimes just the idea behind a game can be enough to draw in new players, ranging from a game composed entirely of boss battles against giant sentient chia pets to just straight up murdering a solid chunk of Greek mythology. But occasionally, a game can have a concept so terrible, so outlandish, that it makes you wonder what sort of unholy drug the designers were smoking when they thought it up, and possibly where you can get a hold of some. Yet sometimes, against all odds, these same games turn out not to be an abomination birthed from the bottom of a bong, but some of the greatest, most entertaining, and most cherished things ever produced by human hands without the aid of illegal substances. Probably. These are the top 10 examples of how a seemingly insane idea that you can't believe was picked up can result in some of the best games you just can't put down. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You are a peasant who returns home to find your cottage burninated by an evil dragon and swear bloody vengeance upon him. However, you aren't allowed to face him until you find a way to set yourself on fire. Sometimes humor is what is expected to carry a game, and when you get right down to it, Peasant's Quest has only one thing going for it, the writing of Matt and Mike Chapman, creators of HomestarRunner.com. Fortunately, this does manage to carry the game on the wings of Valkyries and into the heavens with a chorus of 16-bit trumpets. An affectionate parody of early Sierra adventure games, particularly King's Quest, Peasant's Quest pokes fun at the common tropes of point-and-click adventure games, from unintuitive puzzle solutions to the myriad methods by which a player can die. Even someone unfamiliar with Sierra can enjoy Peasant's Quest, one of the best, if not the best, adventure game parodies ever made. The game's creator sums it up pretty well. Cave Story is a jumping and shooting action game. Explore the caves until you reach the ending. You can also save your game and continue where you left off. Wow, not only can you save, but you can also friggin' load! Truly, this is a monument to great video game design. Here's the thing, it kinda is. Cave Story is a simply designed sprite-based side-scrolling metroidvania that happens to contain some of the best gameplay and storytelling of the past decade. The game starts the protagonist off alone in a cave, no explanation of how he got there or who he is, with nary a tutorial to guide him. The player is left to piece the story together by themselves, slowly revealing an ancient war spanning tens if not hundreds of years, an expedition simultaneously gone horribly wrong and horribly right, and his own murky past. Every aspect of this game is polished to an incredible degree. The levels and enemies are unique, the weapons are original, and the background music gives you a pretty good idea of how good the soundtrack is. Oh, and did I mention that the entire game was designed, written, and coded by one guy, Daisuke Amaya, over the course of five years? Well, the entire game was designed, written, and coded by one guy, Daisuke Amaya, over the course of five years. You want to be the guy. The current the guy does not want you to be the new the guy, so he kills you. Again. And 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 again. After playing an intensely difficult Flash game on 2chan, Kaiyan Nasaki took a good long look at his computer screen and said, hmm, I could do better, and set out to design the single hardest platformer ever created. Many games can make the boast of being difficult beyond reason, containing death traps and enemies that can only be conquered through years of practice. Those games called I Wanna Be The Guy, sir. Delicious fruit falls up and kills you. Platforms move directly into spike traps and kill you. The moon falls out of the sky and chases you into a corner and... Kills you! The sheer absurdity of the number of ways you can be killed forces the player to keep pushing forward just to see what sort of diabolical and nonsensical way the game will murder them next. 
The game also contains a plethora of callbacks to old NES titles of the golden age of video games. By which I mean the first boss is a 200 foot tall Mike Tyson. Who breathes fire. Have fun dying! Try adding this to this without getting this. Ah, uh, Square Enix. Only a company so well versed in bad ideas would have judged a Disney slash Final Fantasy crossover to be a concept worthy of their legacy. If not for Final Fantasy's substantial and rabid fanbase, I doubt this game would have ever sold enough copies to break even, much less turn a profit. But it did, and with good reason. The game was good. The game that had Winnie the Pooh in the same universe as Sephiroth was good. Not only that, but its demographic was immense. The shift from turn-based tactics to real-time combat was a breath of fresh air to traditional JRPG fans, and the seemingly silly team-ups turned out to be exercises in awesomeness for those wishing for a nice spectacle. The Final Fantasy elements held the interest of veteran players, while the Disney-esque art style appealed to both kids and adults drawn in by the nostalgic atmosphere. Kingdom Hearts Stands Tall has proved that despite their best efforts, Square Enix isn't going away anytime soon. You crash land onto an alien planet where everything is trying to eat you and your attacks are near useless. Your only hope in survival rests in making one of the indigenous species look upon you as a deity and micromanaging them into doing your bidding. This involves sending your slaves off to fight against giant monsters, which almost invariably results in horrible massacres en masse. If the player fails to do so without hesitation, they will die from asphyxiation. This was marketed as a children's game. Pikmin is the result of Shigeru Miyamoto looking at bugs as a kid. The rest just sort of falls into place after that. Perhaps one of the most engaging real-time strategy games in recent memory, Pikmin relies on just a few simple game mechanics being applied to a little over 30 unique puzzles with a few monster battles sprinkled in. The game possesses the sort of charm that can only come from being given command of a legion of adorable aliens with the responsibility of keeping them alive. Despite all the Pikmin looking exactly alike, coloration notwithstanding, the player develops an attachment to their little care buddies, helped along by some rather sentimental journal entries made by the game's protagonist, Captain Oliver, as he examines the relationship between himself and the creatures helping him survive. One of the highest rated titles for the Nintendo GameCube, Pikmin is one of those rare real-time strategy games that actually gets the player to care about the fate of his minions. You are a defense attorney in the Los Angeles court system. Your goal is to acquit the defendant you are representing. Whatever possible knowledge there is to be gleaned about courtroom proceedings is completely lost due to the game's flagrant misrepresentation of how a court of law operates. Thanks to the game's flagrant misrepresentation of how a court of law operates, Phoenix Wright has become one of the most popular franchises on the Nintendo DS, turning the courtroom into a battleground wherein characters engage in verbal combat and attack each other with their rhetorical prowess. Relying primarily upon logical deduction, the game faces the player with a series of challenging and legitimately engaging cases that almost always involve murder. Thanks to an above-average localization team, Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney's unique writing remains intact, treating gamers to an original experience that challenges the part of their brains not devoted to blowing things up. Just don't expect it to be of too much help getting into law school. Your father gets drunk and destroys all the stars in the sky. He orders you to go to Earth and roll things up with a sticky ball so he can turn it into a star. You eventually start rolling up entire continents because of daddy issues. None of the previous sentences have been embellished in the slightest.
Katamari Damacy takes a very simple gameplay mechanic and sets it against the backdrop of a ludicrous setting, and, against all odds, manages to bring the two together with flying colors. Literally. The game simply defies explanation beyond the premise. It's like mixing together 50 robot unicorns in a cauldron made of pure love and then pouring the results into an Olympic swimming pool full of LSD with Mr. Rogers serving as lifeguard. You move to a new town without investigating the local real estate market and consequently become bared in massive debt to one of the residents who controls the only store in town. To escape your debt, you must perform errands for your neighbors, only to find yourself owing even more money once the first mortgage is paid off. It is impossible to win the game. When this game first came out in 2002, I remember being extremely hyped about getting it, yet for the life of me I cannot remember why. However, I can definitely remember why I continued playing this game for three years after its release. The goal of eventually paying off your debt serves as a starting motivation for the game, but after a few hours the player becomes more concerned with exploring the colossal amount of content packed onto the disc. Over time, paying off the debt takes a backseat to collecting furniture, hunting down rare bugs and fossils, catching fish, and figuring out new ways to interact with the environment. Thanks to the extremely simple mechanics, the game is open to anyone with a desire to play it, even if they've never picked up a controller in their life, allowing parents to connect with their kids in a medium previously closed off to them. Animal Crossing was, and still is, one of Nintendo's most successful family franchises of all time. An educational game. Do I really need to say more? I mean, since when has an educational game ever been more than a heavy-handed and inevitably failed attempt at getting students to put away their Pokemon cards for five seconds and actually learn something? Since 1974, when Broderbund, a software company based in Oregon, decided to make a game about the history of their state, resulting in one of the most cherished American computer games of all time. Of all time! Nowadays, gamers generally play it for the nostalgia value, reliving the time they shot 50 buffalo in under three minutes, or orchestrated the death of wagon mate Hitler by cholera. But at its core, Oregon Trail possesses genuinely solid gameplay mechanics that have aged remarkably well during its lifespan of over 30 years. A favorite for players of all ages, you'll be hard-pressed to find a more beloved piece of edutainment than Oregon Trail. A game based around an escort mission that comprises about 90% of the gameplay. You are usually armed with nothing but a stick with which to fight off shadowy specters bent on making your life a living hell, and about a third of the dialogue is spoken in a made-up language without English subtitles. Half the difficulty of Ico is just convincing someone to accept the premise and start playing the game. The other half is getting them to stop. Almost universally recognized as one of the greatest examples of storytelling through games ever created, Ico takes an idea that should have yielded a steaming pile of bull droppings and turns out gold-studded diamonds. Most video games are seen as innovative if they take a stab at convincing the player that shooting their ward to see if their screams will sound any different from when they dash off a cliff for the 20th time is a bad thing, but Ico is one of the proud few that can actively boast cultivating a deep emotional attachment to your charge, without whom you can't move objects, open doors, or even save your progress. The level design simultaneously possesses a gorgeous aesthetic and accommodates some of the cleverest puzzles designed in platformer history. Ico has been credited as key inspiration by Jordan Mechner, Eiji Aonuma, Hideo Kojima, and Guillermo del Toro setting the exemplary artistry of the game in both design and story. Challenging, awe-inspiring, touching beyond compare, Ico stands as one of the greatest video games ever made, and my pick for the number one example of a game surpassing the expectations created by its premise.